The films that we watch today are a result of years of experimentation and fine-tuning. Just about every aspect of filmmaking has changed since the Lumiere Brothers film debut of Workers Leaving the Factory. This film is claimed as being the world's first motion picture. Since the film was first released, the ways in which films have been edited has been in a constant state of change, as new styles and techniques have emerged over time. In the film, Workers Leaving the Factory, there's no shot variation and the film is silent. The film simply depicts some people leaving a factory, there's no particular narrative involved. At this point in time, the new technology of the cinemagraph itself was impressive enough to audiences. The Lumiere Brothers film, The Sprinkler Sprinkled, was the first comedy ever made. This film does have an element of storytelling involved. It shows the gardener at work with a hose, before a boy comes and cuts the water off. The boy then releases the water again as a joke, causing the gardener to get sprayed in the face. Another Lumiere Brothers film called Demolition of a Wall was the first film to use reversed footage. This is an early example of the manipulation of diegetic time and space. This effect is not used often today, mostly because it breaks any feeling of realism. However, Marvel's most recent film, Doctor Strange, did use it and it played quite an important role in the film. The fact that this film used reverse footage is one of the reasons for it being more unusual. This effect is more likely to be used for music videos. For example, in Michael Jackson's video for the Earth song, this is more acceptable because the video doesn't have to have the feeling of realism like most films would. This technique was used to show events being undone. On the 27th of December in 1895, a magician called Georges Miniers was at a private showing of some Lumiere Brothers films. This inspired him to try and make some films himself. Miniers is well known for creating special effects for his films using different experimental editing techniques. He is thought of as the father of special effects such as the jump cut. Although Thomas Edison's film The Execution of Mary Stewart was the first film to use this effect in 1895, Miliers discovered it by accident whilst filming when his camera jammed, causing one shot to appear to suddenly jump into another as a result of the delay. Miliers continued to use the jump cut in many of his films. It can be seen here in The Haunted Castle. This cut allowed for people or objects to appear and disappear, as if by magic. Today, the jump cut isn't needed to make special effects. It's usually used to show the passage of time or to condense what would normally take a long time to show, such as in this scene from Evan Almighty when Evan Baxter is getting ready in the morning. The jump cut was not used too often because it broke continuity. However, it became more popular when the French New Wave arrived. Miliers also pioneered the dissolved transition, which was first used in his adaptation of Cinderella he achieved this transition by filming a shot, rewinding the negative and then starting the camera again in a new location or with a subject which has been altered, as is done in the film The Untamable Whiskers. This transition would often have been used to show a scene transition was happening. This was used commonly up until the French New Wave. Films today use the dissolve a bit like a jump cut to show that time has passed. The film 8 Below uses the dissolve transition all the way through to show the passage of time. Miliers was a cinema genius, however his films were mostly done from a theatrical perspective. They did not use any shot variation. Edwin S. Porter is known as the creator of narrative filmmaking. In his film Life of an American Fireman, he combined stock footage of real fires and cut it together with his own shots. This gave Porter's films a more dramatic feeling than Miliers, which were fantasy films. Life of an American Fireman was an early attempt at cross-cutting, meaning that it showed events playing out in different places. However, the editing in this film was not seamless and there were temporal overlaps, meaning that there were events in this film that played out twice, such as when you see these firemen going down the pole, you see them going down from the top, and then you essentially see the same shot again, but from the bottom of the pole. You see this happen another time when this fireman is rescuing a woman. You see the woman panicking before later being rescued from the building, and then you see the whole scene again, but from the outside. Porter's next film, The Great Train Robbery, is another great step in filmmaking. This film features shots in which the camera moves, and let's not forget the iconic medium close-up shot at the end. Porter also began to speed up the pace of the film by making cuts before actions had finished. For example, here he cuts as this train is leaving, so that you don't have to wait for it to leave. This type of editing was the realisation that the manipulation of time is an important part of filmmaking. The choice of prolonging shots or shortening them 
can help to tell the story. A longer and more drawn out shot can add suspense in horror films, such as here in Psycho. A multitude of short shots are used in action films, such as the Bourne trilogy, because it helps to fuel the energy in the scene. The idea that shot variation, as opposed to just the arrangements of subjects within the frame, was also beginning to form. People were seeing that filmmaking didn't have to play out like a stage show would. D.W. Griffith is thought of as being the creator of modern editing styles. As well as this, he knew how to begin using editing as a way of forming narratives in order to engage the viewer and develop drama. In The Grease's Gauntlet, he cut from a wide to mid shot. This allowed for the audience to better see the characters' emotions, and it helps the audience to better form a connection with the characters, which is important in helping the audience to understand character motivation. Griffith also realised the importance of continuity editing, and how it can be used to give the film a feeling of realism by giving it a sense of continuous space and time. Part of this was to use the 180 degree rule. This is when an invisible line is created between the characters and the camera must stay on one side of that line. This makes shots a lot less confusing for the audience and makes sure that they don't get lost in the film's environment. They must understand the geography of a location, otherwise things get confusing. This is a rule that is used in every film unless the director chooses to break it. A famous example would be in Nolan's The Dark Knight in which Batman interrogates the Joker. Where's Dent? Those mob fools want you gone so they can get back to the way things were. But I know the truth. There's no going back. You've changed things. Forever. D.W. Griffith used cross-cutting similar to Edwin S. Porter in The Life of an American Fireman. However, this time he used it seamlessly with no temporal overlaps. In this film, cross-cutting helps to build suspense, which helps to develop drama Modern director Christopher Nolan also uses parallel editing in most of his films. We'll get back to him later. The fact that D.W. Griffith would use cross-cutting to tell multiple storylines was an important part of how films played out narratively. People were afraid that following multiple narratives using cross-cutting would get too confusing for audiences. However, Griffith went ahead with it, comparing it to Charles Dickens' writing style. Griffith created the world's first blockbuster, Birth of a Nation, which combined all of his techniques. However, this film was strongly condemned for being racist. Griffith's next film, Intolerance, heavily influenced the formation of Montage, which we'll go into more soon. Lev Kuleshov was a Russian filmmaker who created what became known as the Kuleshov Effect. This experiment basically explains how the choice and combination of shots can influence an audience's interpretation of what they're being given in a film. The experiment consisted of four pieces of footage, one of a Russian man keeping a blank expression, one of a bowl of soup, one of a deceased child, and one of an attractive woman. Kuleshov then put each of the shots together, the bowl of soup followed by the man, the deceased child followed by the man, and the woman followed by the man. The audience whom he showed this to praised the Russian man's acting for how hungrily he looked at the soup, how sad he looked when he saw the deceased girl and how lustfully he appeared when he saw the woman. Of course, little did they know it was the same footage being used repeatedly. The experiment proves that shot combination can affect how an audience views the action which is taking place. The Kuleshov effect is still being used today. It helps the audience to relate to what a character is thinking by showing a subject and then showing a reaction. For example, here in the beginning of Source Code. At this point, the audience does not know that Coulter Stevens' character isn't aware of where he is or why he's there. To convey this, his character is continually reacting to what's going on, and his reactions show that he is confused, meaning that the audience see how out of place he feels. The Kuleshov effect is used in montage editing, and this leads on to Sergei Eisenstein's work. Eisenstein realised that films could break the rules of continuity using montage editing, meaning that a film could go beyond the confinements of time and space.
famous Odessa step sequence in Battleship Potemkin uses montage to elicit ideas and emotions based on the choice of the shots that are put together. The idea is that by putting certain shots together you can create new meanings, or that a thesis colliding with an antithesis creates a synthesis. This technique was used for propaganda. Eisenstein formed five types of montage. First of all, there's metric, which means cutting the scenes based on the length of each shot, regardless of what's happening in each shot. An example of this would be in The Hunger Games. Next we have rhythmic montage. This follows the rhythm of something happening in the shot. For example, in World's End, it cuts just after each drink has been poured. What? I don't believe this. Tonal montage is cutting based on the emotions that are elicited from each shot based on the lighting or aesthetic look of the shot. An example of this would be in The Lord of the Rings, when Faramir joins the charge on Osgiliath. This scene shows the contrast between the army of men who the audience supports and the armies of Mordor. An overtonal montage is just a mixture of the three styles that we have already covered. The final type of montage is intellectual. This montage will express ideas or concepts based on the shots that are grouped together. If we look back to the Lord of the Rings again, this scene also intercuts clips of Denethor eating, which heavily contrasts what's going on in the other clips of the charge. It has been established that Denethor doesn't care much for Faramir, and this scene really demonstrates it. The fact that Denethor is casually eating whilst his son might be about to die shows that he really doesn't appear to care for him much. Near the end of the sequence, just as the armies of Mordor are firing, it cuts back to Denethor with red juice dripping from his mouth. This not only symbolises the massacre which has just taken place, but it can also represent that it's a result of his words that led to the soldiers' deaths. A famous example of the powerful use of montage was done by Alfred Hitchcock. In this famous scene in Psycho, a montage is used to give the impression that this woman is being murdered, without actually showing her get stabbed. This technique proved to be extremely effective as this scene has gone down as being one of the most iconic film scenes in all of history. Hitchcock also uses music very effectively in his films. If we look back to the shower scene, there's a certain amount of music in the background during the beginning. It then seems to cut out completely with just the sound of water. Of course, during this scene, you can slowly see who we assume to be Mrs. Bates approaching from behind the shower curtain. This and the eerie absence of music build suspense. As soon as the shower curtain is yanked open, dramatic and iconic string sounds can be heard. The sounds of strings are synonymous with the horror genre because they sound like a human screaming. Earlier on in the film, the music is used to build suspense whilst Marion is trying to drive off with lots of money. It continues for a long time which indicates that Marion is still not safe. The music also has lots of high pitched strings in it, which again link to the horror genre. This isn't the only effective way that Hitchcock has used music. For example, in The Bird, he uses the absence of music to create fear. This is very unsettling and it makes it feel as though the audience really could be there because of the quality of realism that it gives the scene. Hitchcock would often withhold information from his viewers in order to almost aggravate them because they want to know what's going to happen. In the sequence where Melanie waits outside the school, you can hear the children singing in the background. This keeps the audience aware of their presence, which builds the sense of danger, because we know that their lives are at stake if the birds attack. The scene uses cutaways, going from Melanie back to the birds a few times. Each time that it cuts back to Melanie, the camera is closer to her face. This is not only unnerving, but gives no room for the audience to see the action behind her. The pacing is purposefully slow, so that the audience has to wait for the reveal. 
Even when Melanie finally does look behind her, the reveal is done very slowly, and finally the audience sees that a large number of birds have accumulated behind her in the time that the audience were forced to watch Melanie. This withholding of information is a great way to dramatise the scene and make the birds seem much more threatening. Withholding information from a viewer is an important part of many films. The Italian film Bicycle Thieves is an older example of this technique being used. The scene has been perfectly set up. The audience understands that Bruno is upset because his father struck him on the face beforehand. So when Antonio leaves Bruno by himself by the river, and people start shouting that a boy is drowning, the audience as well as Antonio have reason to believe that this could be Bruno. This scene could have been rushed, Antonio could have gotten over to the riverside quickly and realised that this isn't Bruno, but instead the scene is played out slowly, meaning that the audience are placed in Antonio's shoes. They must wait in suspense to find out if Bruno is alright. Hitchcock used point of view shots to an advantage, using this technique effectively in films such as Rear Window. In this film, everything comes from Jeff's perspective. He is a photographer who is stuck in one room after an accident, and he suspects that one of his neighbours has been up to no good. The point of view technique here is effective because he is powerless to what's going on outside of his room, and you can only watch from a distance. The audience must experience everything through his eyes, and they are essentially stuck with him. When he is in danger, the audience feel this as well, as they are taken along for the ride. Hitchcock used storyboards extensively for his films. This meant that he knew exactly what he wanted out of his films before shooting, so in a sense he had already edited his film before the footage had been taken. La Nouvelle Vague, or the French New Wave, gained popularity around 1959 with the release of Francois Truffaut's Le Quatre de Coupe, or in English The 400 Blows, as well as with Jean-Luc Godard's A Bout de Souffle, or Breathless, these films were game changers in movie history. The style of filmmaking was the departure from what were the already established rules of filmmaking. Before the French New Wave, film had its own very strict language. It was done in a way that was supposed to be seamless. The editing was invisible. However, the French New Wave would use jarring cuts, camera movement and unconventional shot arrangements, which made the audience more aware that they were watching a film. Mise-en-scene was an important part of this new style. This is basically what's in each shot, and how it is arranged. The films from the French New Wave would have been shot in places that already existed, rather than having sets created specifically for them. This was cheaper to do, and gave the films a more grounded feeling. This also went hand in hand with the fact that these films would often address social issues. The idea that a director could use a camera like a pen in order to convey a message also came about during the French New Wave, meaning that a film was seen as a director's vision as opposed to just being a studio film. Within this film style, filmmakers such as Truffaut and Godard would often film a handheld. This was not only much more practical, but also helped with the idea that traditional film rules had to be broken. Another distinct feature of the French New Wave was having less establishing shots. The French New Wave also found a new place for the jump cut, in Breathless, these were used in a way that seems much more jarring, but innovative nevertheless. Regarde une Talbot, elle est belle, de litres cinq. Tu es un garçon. Quoi Je ne sais pas. Patricia, regarde-moi. C'est interdit d'aller voir ce type. Christopher Nolan uses cross-cutting in most of his films. Inception is a great example of this technique. In this film, a group of people use shared dreaming technology in order to influence a person's way of thinking. The group can create several layers in their dream, meaning that they're dreaming within their dreams. Their experience on the deeper levels are influenced by the first level. So when this fan starts to spin, those who are in the second dream experience the same spinning sensation. Cross-cutting is used to show that two events are taking place simultaneously. The storytelling is made much more suspenseful, the sense that there are multiple scenes of action taking place at once. We can see that each dream layer influences the other, so the stakes are much higher for the characters. Another aspect of this technique allows for the withholding of information. Each layer of the dream is following a different character, and they are all dealing with their own problems. Yusuf is trying to protect the group long enough that he can start the kick by driving off of a bridge. Alpha has to get the group into an elevator and rig it with explosives, and the final group are trying to complete their mission. While the audience watches one layer, they know that there are other characters in danger. However, they cannot always follow them. 
Another great aspect of Inception is the non-linear storytelling. Throughout the film, references are made to the situation with Cobb, his children and his wife. However, a great deal of what really happened is learnt through the eyes of Ariande when she visits Cobb's dreamscape. Cobb's backstory is told slowly because it places emphasis on how important it is. This makes it seem really mysterious, and even sinister. It preys on the audience's mind. This is why when we finally get to the elevator scene, the audience really wants to know what's happened with Cobb's wife. Of course, Cobb finally reveals how she died later on. He then tells the motivation behind it almost at the end of the film. This method of telling Cobb's story keeps it interesting. Nolan doesn't just reveal everything at once, and this gives Mole's character a threatening quality every time she appears. Nolan also uses cross-cutting in The Dark Knight. In this scene, the Joker rigs two fairies to blow up, giving each fairy the detonator for the other one, giving the people the choice of waiting for the other fairy to blow them up, or for them to detonate the other fairy. Both fairies find out about this at the same time, and the film cuts from one to the other. What makes this technique special in Nolan films is the fact that it's usually used near the end of the film, or at a particularly climatic moment. This is effective at building excitement. We've analysed a lot of filmmaking techniques, starting from the late 1800s up to today. The rules of film have clearly changed a great deal over time, but it's obvious that each pioneer and each new discovery led up to the wealth of editing styles that we have today. As did each pioneer pave the way for new talent and new visionaries to try their hands at the art of film.